really happy to welcome Mr. John O'Leary. And um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Mr. O'Leary speak before, but I'll tell you it is one of great inspiration, of great faith, great hope, and great positive attitude. I'm not going to steal his thunder, but just to give you a bit of a background, John O'Leary, as he says in his biography, is not supposed to be alive. He's supposed to have died. When he was a nine-year-old boy, and let's think about every little nine-year-old boy you've ever known, curiosity, right? Well, when he was nine years old, he started playing with fire and gasoline, created a massive explosion in his home, and burned over 100% of his body. His parents chronicled his story, entitled Overwhelming Odds in 2006. But today, we're so grateful to have him here with us to give us a great story of inspiration, and as I said, hope and faith. And I really am so glad to have him here. We were talking before he came up about what binds us all together in this room. What is it? Love, faith, family, and the fact that we all are committed to what we do. We believe in this industry. We know what we do. We are bound in the fact that we have the God-given ability to produce the food for this world to consume. That's what binds us together. So with that being said, Mr. John O'Leary. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my friends, I've had the honor of presenting some 2,000 times in front of more than 2 million people, uh, 49 states. We're looking at you, Alaska. 17 countries, and uh, every single opportunity is an honor. And on almost every single one of the calls that I have ahead of time, there's a question that we go through together. Uh, so, for instance, Andy and I went through the questions on this one together. But question number 13 is, what topics do you not want John O'Leary to talk about? What do you not want to talk about? And on every single one of those little conversations, they always bring up two things. Number one is politics. Don't talk politics. And secondly, they say, and don't talk faith. Do not talk faith with our group. Andy did not talk about either one of those things as things not to talk about. Not only that, you let off your meeting today in prayer uh, because we recognize our lives are dead without prayer, without the foundation of that faith that not only is the reason for our life, but also what makes sense of it as we go forward into life. So uh, leaders and ranchers and sons and daughters and friends and fellow citizens, I am so honored to be with you today and to elevate faith and our country and our industry, and our family, and our hope. And this is not to say that things are always easy, but I, I believe in my heart of hearts that uh, although it may not be easy, the best days in this room are in front of us. I hope you believe that way too. If not, you can go through the line a second time, and maybe when you come back in, you'll recognize, my gosh, I am blessed and highly favored. And today, in the great state of Texas, with 11 other states gathered with us. Think about that, man right here in Canadian. 11 other states gathered with us. We celebrate what's possible. But it's not easy. How, how many of you have you've ever had a bad day? <laughs> One fellow right here. Out of 500 ranchers, I have a tough time believing that. How many of you were in business in 2011? Did you ever have a tough day, yes or no? All of us. When we struggle, not if. When we struggle, when we struggle in marriage or lack thereof, when we struggle on the ranch, when we struggle in our families, when we struggle in our health or our finances, not if. The storm's coming. When we struggle and when we choose to be a victim to it, what is the victim's favorite question to ask? We're going. Ladies and gentlemen, Sons and daughters, I want to give you all three questions today to stop asking. In Canadian Texas, 
with a half inch of water laid down by God last night? Why me is a question we will not ask today. Things aren't perfect, but the foundation is firm and the future is bright. Why me? Okay, so it's a question we won't ask because if we do, we cross our arms to possibility and ownership and then we look down and say, well, who cares? Who, things have changed around me. Who cares? Who cares? And when we ask that question, we soak through our days, looking down all the way through, and ultimately ask the third and the final question, which is, what more can I do? I'm only one, man. It's 499 other people in this room. I'm too old. I'm too young. Things have changed. What more can I do? Uh, but today, my friends, we're going to be asking different questions through a different lens. So as that incredible lunch settles in your tummies, I'd like us to look to the east and watch that sunrise again. How many of you saw the sunrise today? Or how many of you make a habit out of watching the sunrise when it does pierce through the clouds? I think it's the greatest gift of our days, and frequently we miss it because we oversleep or because we're looking the wrong way. I, I, I beg you all, as you wake up early, look to the east. Watch that dark sky turn bright again. And as that little flame comes across the sky, in awe, citizens, yell out the question, why me? Eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that beat free in this country. Man, why me? Why me? I'm lucky. I'm blessed. I recognize that. I get out of bed. I dance to the shower in Canadian, Texas, grab that little nozzle, turn that baby upright, and every morning something remarkable happens. What, what, what happens? Water. And, and right now, some of us are seated back thinking, dude, get to the point. And brothers and sisters, man, I, I'm knee deep in the point. If hot water in an arid climate bores you, don't go home tomorrow. Uh, grab your passport and travel almost anywhere else in the world. And we won't take it for granted anymore. I think we got it so good, sometimes we forget. La last year, I don't know if you all know, 94% of the news stories broadcast out by cable television, 94% of the news stories were bad. Is that the country you live in? <laughs> Is that your family? Is that your community? Is that your rant? Is that your life? 94% of our lives are bad. According to the media, the answer is yes, that's true. Uh, let's see life through the lens of truth. It's not perfect, but it's good. Let's go. So we ask the question, why me? We roll up our sleeves a little bit farther. We take that hot shower and we say, thank you, God, for it. And then we uncross our arms. We get after it every day. We work hard. We play hard. And we say, who cares? Things are changing but we embrace that change. We embrace it, who cares? This is a question around mission and meaning. Why we do the work we do in the first place, the generational impact of it, feeding the world, <laughs> which allows us to finish strong by asking the third and the final question. Any, anybody wanna guess what the third question is? It's on the screen. <laughs> like 48 font, big old letters. What more can I do? do? Do you see a similarity in those two sets of questions? You don't. OK. So these were the first three. Here come the second three. Do you see a similarity, yes or no? Man, it turns out that the manner in which you choose to see things, all things, will influence what you see and how you feel about it what you think, what you believe, the words you speak, the actions you take, and the results you get on the ranch and in life. Today, we choose in Canadian Texas to see life and see work and see opportunities through the lens of truth, which is not always easy, but it's good. It is good. The foundation remains firm. So my friends, today, we're going to go through these questions, starting with question number one. Anybody want to guess what question number one might be? Why me, man? Iced teas in my belly, water and coffee and food, dessert. Why me? Why me? L looking back at your own life, have you ever done anything that you now realize was a big mistake? <laughs> looking back at last night, have you ever done anything that you now realize was a big mistake? I mean, all the time, man. All the time. 
all the time. When I was a little boy, I grew up way away in St. Louis, Missouri. My two sets of grandparents were both farmers, but I grew up in a more like urban setting. I saw kids in my neighborhood playing with fire and gasoline. What these kids would do is they would sprinkle gasoline on a sidewalk, they would strike a match, stand back two feet uh, for safety. <laughs> Very risk averse in Missouri. Throw the match on top and the liquid would dance to life. And when you are nine and you are a male, this is awesome. You are watching liquid turn to fire. And these are guys you look up to, man. They're practically men. They're 11. Okay. You're every bit of nine. They got peach fuzz. You still don't. And you're thinking, if those big old guys can do that and get away with it, what's the next sentence? I can too. Which is powerful language when you're following the right voice. When you're in the right room when you're looking up at the right guy or the right lady. But if you're in the wrong room, if you're listening to the wrong voice, if you're following the wrong ideas, it's gonna take you off the edge. It's one of the cool reasons I think 500 plus of us gathered in Canadian Texas, competitors kind of, to talk about work and life and possibility when we come together because together we're better. It allows us to see the fumes, to see what we may not see otherwise. That day, I'm following the wrong ideas off the ledge. I come into my mom and dad's garage, bend over a five-gallon can of gasoline before the liquid comes out. What comes out first? Fumes. The invisible stuff. Uh, came out. I never saw this coming. How could you? Created a massive explosion, split that little can in two, and launched the kid 20 feet against the far side of the garage. When we were little, we were taught and trained what to do when we're on fire. What are we supposed to do? Stop, drop, and roll. What do you actually do, though, when you're on fire? Why are those different answers? You're scared. This is why it matters to you today. We train up here. It's very, it's very easy to come to conference and take, take notes. Researchers. But then you got to go through that door where you got to walk through that garage, you got to hop back into your truck, you got to drive home, and you got to take what you heard into a place where you can live it. Part of my job is to not only inspire you and entertain you after lunch. Anybody could do that. I, I really think my job is to me, remind you of the possibility within these, these messages that you're hearing today and tomorrow, certainly with Temple and others, that what you know is ultimately only measurable and powerful when it comes down to your heart and you take action. It's not enough to be moved. You've got you to move yourself. That, that day for me, I panicked. I ran. It was all head knowledge. I just ran for my life. It changed everything. One moment, I'm a happy and healthy. I'm going to zoom in for the folks in the far back. Okay. I mean, just being honest, extremely good looking. Okay. B bangs like that. That's either a laser level, or what else might it be? That's a bulb. That's the touch of a mother, man, right across your forehead again and again and again. And that little white thing below his chin, what's that called? It's not a turtleneck. It's a freaking dicky. Some of you don't even know what a dicky is, man. Don't be Googling dicky right now. It may take you down to the wrong path, man, all right? I was pulling up today, and I was looking at these two fine animals outside, and uh, my driver, Craig, said, uh, yeah, those are two, two bulls. And so I said back to him as a city boy, how do you know? And he looked at me and gave me one of those looks like, really? You really need to ask me that right now, huh, buddy? Uh, so now I know how you can tell them apart. So I need you all to know that, man. I'm a part of the family, finally. But my life was good. Has your life ever been so good that you missed it? Like, the, the lunch was served hot, and the tea was served cold, and the weather was perfect. You got a half inch of rain last night. Life was good, and then we get busy and we miss it. 
My life was so good, I missed it. I got two parents. I don't know about you. I got four grandparents who were all still alive at that age. Two of them are farmers. We used to go out to my grandfather's house, his farm, kind of western St. Louis. We would sit around Indian style eating watermelon and fried chicken, and he would talk about what it was like being in the Navy during World War II. And then my other grandfather would talk about how he had it way harder because he was in Europe during World War II. And we would sit there as little kids at, looking up at our heroes. But I think our life was so good, we might, we might have missed it. And what I would, would encourage 11 plus states to remember in this room is how good things are. They're not perfect. It never will be this side of eternity. But man, we, we got something good here. Let's celebrate this day and make it better for tomorrow. My, my day was so good, I think I missed it as a child. And then it changed on me. The, the next picture will be really hard to look at. So I know some of you have little ones in the room. Some of you have squeamish stomachs. You may want to shut your eyes just for a moment. But I found myself on my back with burns on 100% of my body. It, it is a death sentence, that's for sure. I remember laying there as a little one, looking up at the bright light. And as a child, the only thought I had that morning was, oh my gosh. My dad is white. One more time, class. Your daddy's going to kill you, boy. How many of you had a disciplinarian growing up? And uh, the other 481, you did it all by yourselves. <laughs> 19 of you had a disciplinarian. The other 481, you know, man, I did this. Welcome to Texas, brother. <laughs> out of the way, man. Watch out. I'll do it. What a bunch of bull. It is. It is a bunch of bull. You can't do much by yourself, it turns out. But together, watch out. It's on. One of the great heroes and disciplinarians of my life was my father. He's a veteran. He's a business owner. Um, he's awesome. But I just blew up his house. What I knew to be true, my father would be furious. I hear his voice down the hall. He's yelling at some poor nurse, where is my boy? John, and I'm back there thinking, oh my gosh, the old man has come to finish me off. Like, <laughs> this thing is over. And this nurse does me no favor. She brings him back into the room. Should have called security. The old guy pulls back the curtain, and then he walks in. And he was old. Uh, he was 41. Is 41 old today, yes or no? no? When you were nine, was it old? Yes. What changed? What changed? Perspective, wisdom, experience, years, you. Don't give that away to your neighbor or some politician or some media. Own it, man. Choose it for yourself. Own your perspective. My dad came in old, I knew. He came in mad for sure. He walks over to me, he points down and very firmly says, John, look at me when I'm talking to you. So I look up at my father and then he says, I have never been so proud of anybody in my entire life. And my little buddy today, this morning, man, I am proud to be your dad. And then my father says, I love you. I love you. I love you. And as a child, I just crossed my arms tight and snug, looked down like this and remember thinking, oh my gosh. Nobody told my dad what happened. <laughs> I wonder if I can get away with this. <laughs> you ever been there? You bunch of liars. <laughs> every one of us, man. Sin. We've all been there. A every single one of us. For me, you know, you look back at Scripture, it's important we recognize it didn't happen 2,000 years ago. It, it's happening today. It's alive and well. I, I remember that story, and I remember feeling exactly like the prodigal son felt upon coming home. Like I, I, I felt that. I, I, I've been there. <laughs> 
I'm a character in Luke's story. And I would say I'm not the only one in this room. Every, every one of us. And if you haven't felt the Father's love yet, you will. So that, that's, if nothing else is good news in your life right now, there's some good news for you. It's coming. You will feel that embrace. My dad gave me that embrace. I think it changed the, the trajectory of my entire life. That love does that. It, it did not make losing your fingers to amputation easy. It, it did not make five months in burn care easy or two years of therapy and surgery easy or a lifetime of some physical challenges. That's not easy. But I think it made the journey forward possible. Love does this. Community does this. Faith does this. Um, every morning of our lives, whether we live in Texas or Oklahoma or New Mexico or Missouri or anywhere else that y'all came from, we all look to the east and we watch that sunrise and we all ask the same question. But today we get to decide the mindset with which we ask it. Are we victims to it? What happened way back then in 11, or before that, or our childhood, or yesterday, or the way in? Or are we victors? It's our choice, and it matters. The choice we make here, it matters. So today, with that little noise in the background, I love it. We are going to be asking this question, not as victims to the day, but as victors. Men and women who have overcome, who have been saved, who are better, and the foundation is firm. So we ask the question collectively, man, why me? And then with that lunch still in front of us, we begin answering it. I am grateful for it. Every morning of our lives, on our knees, why me? I am grateful for it. So I'm going to be quiet in a, mom in a moment and let you all ask this question, answer it with that, and then at the very end of it, put one more name onto it. The name of one person. Maybe she's in this room. Maybe he's next to you. Maybe he raised you. Maybe they're in heaven. Maybe it's a child. Maybe that's why you do what you do in the first place. You're kids, man. One person who inspired you to become the best version of yourself. You'll need an answer because in a couple moments you'll be sharing. And before you all share at your tables, I'll go first. So when I say why me and make a list of things I'm grateful for and come up with one name, I also come up with the name of a woman I saw last night. Her name is Mom. My mother and father are still married. It's been 51 years for them. Life is not easy for them. Uh, but they remain living examples of possibility to us. Dad has had Parkinson's disease now for 27 years. He's nonverbal. He can't talk. Uh, but he radiates joy. I bet we all know folks like this. He just radiates joy. And my mother is right there with him, guiding him forward. Uh, when I came home from the hospital after a five-month street fight, I looked a little bit like this kid. And I sat at our kitchen table and I had no fingers and there was an IV with morphine on me. My mother answers the door three days later. So she goes out to the door, she brings someone into her house and right away, I recognized the woman's voice. Uh, it's Mrs. Bartello. Okay. M Mrs. Bartello is our piano teacher. I hated piano, <laughs> which means I hated Mrs. Bartello. I want to play baseball as a kid. Man, all I want to do is play sports in the backyard, mama. Why is she here? That's what I'm thinking. Why is this woman here? Because I know, leaders, go ahead and take a good look. Man, I'm never playing the piano again. I know, I know that to be true. My mother comes into the kitchen. I look up and I say, mama, why is she here? And I want you ladies, and I want you brothers, to remember how my mama responds. You may need this answer today. You may, you'll probably need it tomorrow for sure. Mama, why is she here? Not a word. Talk is cheap. Talk is so cheap. When what is ultimately required in our families, in our faith journey, in our community, in this room, is humble action. Here's an action movement. Momentum is a hard thing to stop. My mother unhooks my brakes on the wheelchair. She rolls me away from that pity party. I look up and I say, Mama, where are you taking me? And here's what she says back. Not a word. Just rolls me. All the way into the living room, we end up in front of a piano. There's a lady named Mrs. Bartello, and I'm taking piano class. 
I hate my mama. Like, big time. And I think the only time I hated, hated her more was the following Tuesday, when that doorbell rang, and the following, and the following, for five. What's the next word? Years of Tuesdays with Mrs. Bartolo. If you ever see my house, you'll find a guy who's happily married, owns a piano, and has four little kids who hate their dad. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons for that one. But one of them is that uh, on Tuesdays at about 3.30, the doorbell rings, and those kids line up. Uh, my friends, I'm going to put this question on the screen again, up there, way up high, that one person who inspires you and while you reflect or meditate or pray over that one, what I'd like to do is walk way over here <laughs> and play a little song on the piano. This, this was the very first song that my mother taught me. When, when she first started teaching me, my left arm was up in an airplane splint like that. And my right hand was in a boxing glove, essentially. So the song you're going to hear today sounded like this. Not bad. Not bad. But then they did a surgery which freed me to have back my right hand, one finger at a time. And when you get focused, it's just amazing what we as individuals, we as families, and we as a community can do in this room. Um, so I'm going to play this song for you right now. It's my mother's favorite. As I play it, your job is to do two things right now, leaders. Number one, lower your expectations for the piano. <laughs> Maybe later on, they'll bring in someone that can rock this baby, but he's not in front of you right now. And then secondly, as Texans, or from wherever you come from, from the United States, I think we ought to elevate expectations of what we believe is possible in our lives by first slowing down to take inventory of how fortunate we are. So... Uh, for two minutes, just slow down and take pause of how, how, how blessed we are, okay? So that's a song some of you may be familiar with. <laughs> uh, for Mrs. Bartello. She never would have imagined in her wildest years that that little burnt up, broken down, wheelchair bound, fingerless boy would have played a piano in front of 500 folks, servants, leaders, parents, sons and daughters, ranchers in Canadian Texas. 
what she was helping me do, and I think what we help those who follow behind us do, is to see right around the corner, to see what's possible in their own lives. Uh, what she was really saying to me, and I think what we get to say to the reflection in the mirror and to those that we serve and those that we lead is this, way more important than piano. Here's what she was saying to me. Baby, they may have taken your fingers. They have not taken your life. We have been through some storms. We have been through some droughts. You have lost some things. And yet you remain in this room in love. And the best is in front of us. Uh, not easy, but it's true. So here we go. I'm going to slow down right now. And I'm going to be quiet for a moment, which ought to bring about a large, long ovation. You're going to grab the microphone. And you're going to turn to the nearest lady, gentleman, friend, son, daughter, colleague at your tables, stranger for some. And you're going to answer the question on the screen, which I realized, man, that's awkward. I don't even know this guy. So I'm going to help you all break the ice. Just repeat after me. Hi. Hi. This is awkward for me, too. Look at me when I'm talking to you. <laughs> I love you. There's nothing you can do about that. Nothing. And one person who inspires me to become the best version of myself is, is, uh. so leaders and servants and ranchers and friends and colleagues and professors and teachers and Andy and everybody else in the room, I'm going to be quiet for a couple minutes. I invite you all to grab the microphone, turn away from me, turn away from work for a moment and stress for a moment. Grab a friend. Share the love and then lean back and bask as someone else talks a little bit about their story. Okay? So I, everybody, just forget about me for a moment. Take about three minutes, grab a friend at your tables, and answer the question on the screen. Make sure they're looking at you before you start talking, though. <laughs> Here we go. Three minutes, real quick.
That's enough salt. <laughs> Back to cattle. You know, for the cool thing about life, if you're looking for people to respect, is they're everywhere. Like they are everywhere. And uh, for me, I got several folks in the room. I won't name them all, but one of the guys is Andy. He's got that big old five-gallon hat on over there. Here's a fellow who comes up with this, after weathering his own storm, a mighty storm, comes up with an idea of attracting a few friends together and Canadian, and then a few more friends, and then a few, a few more friends. And you look around the room today, man, it is sold out. And as I pulled up today with Craig in our truck, the trucks were lined outside like a presidential barricade. Like it was lined out of the out of the out, all the way to the the highway, and not only with Texas license plates. So Andy, your story and your love and your enthusiasm for your work, it's contagious. So um, we're here for a lot of reasons, but you're one of them, and I'm I'm aware of that. I'm grateful for it. Right on. <clears throat> How many of you listen to a podcast? I'm going to skip over this one. Anybody ever listen to podcast? Okay. So like you get to kind of like choose the radio signal podcast. And we, we have one that I would just encourage you to check out at some point if you ever listen. In, anywhere you pulled on your podcast, ours is called Live Inspired. So Live Inspired with John O'Leary. That's like the title of our podcast. It's free. Nothing, nothing to buy there. It's just free. It's a gift. We interview people that I respect. Like uh, maybe you've heard of Dave Ramsey. Or um, we interviewed great artists and musicians. We interviewed the band Journey. We interviewed country musicians. And I recently interviewed this guy right here. His name is Gary Sinise. And I interviewed Gary Sinise because of this role. <laughs> so if you don't know Gary Sinise, that's all right. But I bet you know Lieutenant Dan. Do you remember Lieutenant Dan? <laughs> And so I bring this guy in, man, and, and I'm pretty fired up. He's like a Hollywood guy, and I'm a normal Midwest kid. I'm meeting this guy. And then I realize what his real heart is, is not for Hollywood at all. Uh, his real heart is for our veterans and our first responders. Uh, all this guy really does is work in order to better serve our veterans. And it was a story that <laughs> blew me away. One guy with focus on someone greater than himself, has every single year for the last 11 raised more than $30 million for our veterans. One guy, one guy, more than $30 million for our veterans. He builds them houses, he takes care of their orphans, he loves them, he loves them. He's an incredible inspiration. So we, we share stories like this so that as we go through rainy seasons and droughts in our own lives, we can be reminded that there are people making a difference and we are called to be one of them. Like we're called to be one of them. So if you, you ever want to check it out, it's called Live Inspired. That's our podcast, Live Inspired. And every single podcast ends with this question. This will take us to the finish line and our break. Anybody want to guess what the question is? <laughs> one more time, ladies and gentlemen. What more, can I do? what more can I do for our industry, for my family, for my church, for myself? Uh, for a lady or gentleman struggling in this room or down the, down the driveway for me, what more can I do? For an aging parent, for a young daughter, for an orphan in our community, what more can I do? Imagine asking that question nightly. What more can I do? So this is a story that I'm going to share with you as we wrap up about one guy who asked that question every night of his life. It led him to serve during World War II. It led him to uh, become a Hall of Fame announcer. And it led him also to become a Hall of Fame leader, servant, man. So th this is his story. I just happen to be one of the characters in it. I I'm, I'm laying in the hospital bed the day after I get burned, and I can't move my arms or my legs. I'm tied down to the bed like this. My lungs are burned, so they put a hole in my neck. What's that called? You got a trach. So now you can breathe, but you can't eat or drink. It's like being at a conference. 
Not only that, but you got to sit down on your rear end all day long. Man, like, you can't do nothing. And I had one other challenge. My eyes were swollen shut, so I can't see. So I'm, I'm struggling. You guys ever struggled? I am struggling. I'm a victim to this. My favorite question was, why me? I just asked it through the wrong lens. And occasionally, I'd come back into the, the light with a little bit of faith, a little bit of hope, a little bit of love. I would dream and imagine and pray and listen. Have you ever noticed how much more you hear when your eyes are shut? I mean, some of you have been listening beautifully all afternoon. <laughs> when your eyes are shut, you hear. And growing up in St. Louis, Missouri, there's basically one thing we like to listen to. And it's pictured up there. You may boo if you're a Rangers fan. I get it. You may boo if you're a fan of some other team. I totally get it. We went to that game last night, actually. That's St. Louis. That's my city. There's our arch. That's our team, the Cardinals. I'm a baseball man. And the way we used to watch baseball and football and any other sport we liked was not with our eyes growing up. It was with what? Radio. We had an old-time announcer named Jack Buck. Jack Buck was a war veteran, Purple Heart recipient from a little skirmish called the Battle of the Bulge. A man's man who served frequently. He heard about what happened to a little boy named John O'Leary. The following day, that same little fellow's laying in the hospital bed dying. No reason for hope here. And then the door opens up. It's kind of like the stone got pushed back. Well, the stone got pushed back and light broke through the darkness. And I hear this voice that says to me, kid, wake up. Wake up. You are going to live. You are going to survive. Keep fighting. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark will make it all worthwhile. And then he says, kid, are you listening? So I look up at him and I say, and then he says, <laughs> this is a true story. Good. Good. Keep fighting. That's my one interaction with Jack Buck. He walked out of that room and he left a child tied down in that hospital bed on fire for life. I wrote a book called On Fire, and it's not called On Fire because I got burned. It's called On Fire because what God does through the community afterwards. Jack came into my life one time and changed me. I learned later on, he made his way down a hallway, leaned his head against a glass door, and he just started weeping, weeping like a baby, which we all know is the sign of great weakness. Yes? I mean, if you're crying every day at work, that might be too much emotion, you know. But on occasion, uh, I think it's a sign of health. The shortest verse in Scripture, anybody know what it is? Yes, he did. So should we. Both out of sorrow on occasion, but out of great joy other times. When you hear that little baby, I don't even know. When you see that little baby, that blonde hair making noise, like we ought to weep sometimes, man. It ought to break you to your knees. And oh, I'm so blessed. I didn't deserve any of this. Thank you for it. Uh, Jack wept, not because he's weak, but because he cares. One of the nurses comes over to him, looks up at him, and says, Mr. Buck, are you all right? We can't lose you. You're the only celebrity in St. Louis. Okay. <laughs> and this guy looks down and says, I'm not sure that little boy won't make it, will he? And the expert on her knees, there's always experts in any room. And she looks up and she says, Mr. Buck, there is absolutely not a chance. It is his time. When this news comes into our industry, it will come. They're growing beef in Petri dishes. The end is near. When it comes... Really? I mean, you're going to hear this all the You're going to just hear this. America's over with. Best days are behind us. It is done. When the news comes into our life, what we do next with it will matter. How we take ownership will matter. What this great servant does up there, he takes it home, he cries, he prays, he reflects, and he journals on one question. And what more can I do? What more can I do? My marriage, my singleness, my faith walk, our family, our ranch. The following day, there's a little fella named John O'Leary tied down to a bed dying. 
It's a Monday morning. There's no reason for hope. And then the door opens up, footsteps walk in, a chair gets pulled across the floor, and then the stone gets rolled back. Jack Buck walks in a second time and says, kid, wake up. I'm back. (laughs) You are going to live. You're going to survive. Keep fighting. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark. It'll make it all worthwhile. See you soon. And then he leaves, and then he comes back. Day after day after day for five months, encourages the little boy to fight on, to dream on, to believe on, which leads to this homecoming. Two months later, he picks me up in a Lincoln town car. I'd never been in a Lincoln in my entire life. I don't know how many of you have been in a Lincoln. Back in the 80s, there were so many little ashtrays in the back of this car. I like, I... I mean, you could smoke in any seat, plus a couple that weren't even street legal. Like, I remember five ashtrays in the back of a car. That's how the other half lived, man. There were just ashtrays everywhere. And I remember, remember going down and hanging out and being part of this festivity and meeting these players and meeting the managers and being on the field and being blown away in grace and in love. Uh, and I also remember going upstairs that night and broadcasting the game with my friend Jack Buck. He put me on the radio and he says, on live national radio broadcast to West Texas and beyond, he said, it's John O'Leary Day at the ballpark. The New York Mets are in town. Kid, are you having fun? (laughs) And on live national radio, I look up and I respond. (laughs) Because I'm shy. Jack sees a little boy who doesn't talk. He sees a little boy that's got no hands. He sees a little boy who's burned bad, who can't get out of the wheelchair yet. He sees everything that's wrong, and it is so easy in our businesses, our ranches, our family, lives, our country, to see what is wrong. And if you don't believe me, watch the news tonight. 94% of it will be wrong. But there's another way to view our lives, and to view our families, and to view our culture, and to view our country. Through the lens of truth. (laughs) It doesn't make the scars go away. It just reminds you there's another side of the story. It doesn't mean you don't go through a good Friday. You do. Fridays come. But the good news in this room, Sundays follow. Always. When you see this little boy up there, what jumps off that screen at you? This big old goofy grin. Jack sees the joy and the pain. He takes home the two that come together, the good and the bad. And then he prays that night on one question. What's the question? The following day, I get a baseball signed by a Cardinal player named Ozzy Smith. He's a Hall of Fame shortstop. Below that ball was a little note that read, kid, if you want a second baseball, all you have to do is send a thank you letter to the guy who signed the first. Uh, Just one problem, Jack. What's the problem, class? You got no fingers, man. We don't even know how you're holding the clicky thing. Okay. We sure don't know how you play this thing up here, man. I could not write. My mama had been trying to get me to write for a long time. She used to come into my room and say, baby, when you learn how to write again, you get to go back to school. (laughs) That may work in Canadian. (laughs) It ain't working up in Missouri. Like, I don't want to go to school. But do you think I want a second baseball, yes or no? I write this note mail it off, and two days later, I got a second baseball, second note that read, kid, if you want a third, kid, if you want a fourth, kid, if you want a fifth, kid, if you want a sixth. 1987, one servant sends a little nobody 6D baseballs. 60. Teaching a little nobody, no such thing, man. Like, your life is a gift. Act like it. You are a sacred treasure. Act like it. You matter. Act like it. Jack taught a little boy who did not know he mattered and could not write to realize he mattered and to begin to write. One guy. Uh, Brought me back to grade school. (laughs) Grade school was followed by four years of high school. That was followed by nine years of college. Okay. (laughs) That's a different story. We ain't got time for it today. And he's giving me like this, like, take it off, O'Leary. 
graduation followed, and then graduation night, the miracle finally happened in my life. The miracle for me, one of them, is love. I never dated in middle school, high school, or college. That is a long drought, okay? <laughs> oh, Lord, let it rain. <laughs> Nothing. And then at age 22, graduation night, the miracle shows up. Can I, sh can I show you her picture, yes or no? Yes. Here she is. she gorgeous? <laughs> Who'd you expect? Love. Men and ladies doesn't always look like what we expect. Sometimes it looks like a 19-year-old brunette. You're going to fly home to her tonight. You met her the summer after you graduated college. She's an OT student. She's got brown hair and brown eyes. She's gorgeous. But you haven't met her. Other times she looks like a 77-year-old man with Parkinson's disease and stage four lung cancer. And yet when you see this picture of a guy dying, do you see a picture of a man dying, yes or no? Man, shoulders back, finishing strong. Um, he shows up at night with one final package, one final gift by asking one final question. Anybody wanna guess what the question was? What more can I do at home, my marriage, my singleness, without addiction, my faith walk for our industry. What more can I do? Okay, this means a lot to me. Hope it means a lot to you too. Enjoy it's yours. This is the baseball that I received when I went into the Hall of Fame. It's made of crystal. It is priceless. There's only one like it in the entire world. And then he writes, don't drop it. <laughs> that gift led a little boy to believe, which I think led to this picture known as the greatest sales job of my entire life. <laughs> okay. Now you know I'm flying home tonight, man. She gave me him. He's named after a great mentor, Jack. Jack has a little brother named Patrick. When I'm out of town traveling, my wife hates when I'm gone, so she'll take my little fellas and then she'll punish them, punish me by dressing them like this, okay? <laughs> I rip them out of the Sunday smocks, get them back into their gear, tell them I love them. Nothing they can do about it. Remind Jack and Patrick to love on Henry. And in Missouri, they just keep showing up, okay? <laughs> Jack, Patrick, Henry, and now finally a little baby girl. Her name is Grace. You, you do find, if you travel too frequently, that two parents who both have dark hair, Can I have two kids with blonde? So I'm going to be coming back next year. We'll be talking about forgiveness. Okay, it's going to be a really powerful message during this Easter week. You're not looking at hair color up there or skin tone or, hey, I wonder where they worship. You're looking at this grand picture of love, and it is what I felt from the moment I've walked into this room, this magnificent, unified picture of love. Not easy, but it does ensure that our best days remain in front of us. And so I want to leave you with this question in a moment. Anybody want to guess what the final question is? <laughs> I'm boring, man. I just keep hitting repeat. This question changed Jack Buck's life and those lucky enough to be served by him. And for the last seven years, it's been changing mine too. It's free. And it's probably the best advice I could offer today. Consider journaling every night of your lives on one question before you hit that, pet, that bed exhausted. What more can I do? What more? One thing, different today, different tomorrow than I did today. What more can I do? So as we wrap up, I'm going to ask for a little activity. How many of you own a cell phone? How many of you have it handy? Let me be more specific. Uh, if you have it handy, please grab it. And if it works right now in this space, I'd like you to text me your email address. I spoke at a conference about two years ago, and a couple of the fellows came up to me and said hello. And they said, John, I still get the emails. And I reminded them, man, you can still hit reply. So this is an invitation for all of you, 500 new friends. I'd like you to text me your email address. My number's on the screen, but I'll yell it out so you can just stare looking down. My number is 314-202-5373. And the ask is that you text me your email address or the email of someone you don't care for. 
I'll, t- I'll take either one. So final time, ladies and gentlemen, 314-202-5373, your email, and then hit send, be done. I'll take care of the rest. This will generate three things. Number one, Monday morning next week, I'm coming back into your life. We call it Monday Morning Motivation with John O'Leary. We tell amazing stories of individuals who see problems and rather than complaining about them, do something about it. Uh, what a remi- great reminder for all of us, including me for sure. So 314-202-5373, your email. You'll get the Monday Morning Motivation. Also, if you ever have a kid in your neighborhood who gets burned or someone on your ranch or someone's going through something, a, a, a struggle, whatever, like hit reply. If I can serve you guys and serve you ladies who serve our nation, I am in. So if I can ever make a difference for you somehow through prayer or by sending you out a little book or whatever else, just ask. The answer is yes. Okay. And then thirdly and finally, we're going to invite you into our little community. We meet monthly uh, through the gift of virtual technology. And it's a way for us to get back together and talk about leadership, life, business, possibility, challenges, and how to make it all a little bit better. We call it studio. So uh, join me in studio. I think it's a cool place to stay in touch. As we get ready to wrap up, um, do you all think one person can change the world? Yes or no? Do you believe you can? Yes or no? I'm sorry, yes or no? Some say yes, some say no, some don't participate. A couple things. One is if you don't participate, you can't complain. P- politically, and within our institutions, with, within our organizations, within our ranches, our marriage, if you don't participate, you, you can't complain. So my invitation for all of us is man, actively participate. Roll up the sleeves and get after it because your vote, your presence, your prayers matter. So actively participate. And then recognize that your participation at any level does in fact matter. My question sometimes as I sit here thinking about what some of you are thinking is it might be, John, it's a great story. But brother, I'm no Jack Buck, man. I'm no Hall of Famer. I got my hands full and my plate is over full. What more can I do? I'm underwater right now. How did Jack Buck hear then as we wrap up? How did Jack Buck hear? Here's how Jack Buck heard, and this is why it matters to you. My next door neighbors, her name was Carol. She was a widow. Her windows blew out of her bedroom when the explosion happened next door. So she woke up. She gets out of bed, sees the O'Leary house on fire. She brings my siblings into her house. She calls 911, and then she starts the phone chain. She calls a neighbor who calls a friend who calls a friend. So we're four deep already. And then that woman calls a guy, her dad. And that night, that guy goes to a charity auction on January 17th, 1987, and they seat him right here up front next to a guy with white hair named Jack Buck. And through the gift of one by one by one, Jack Buck heard about a little boy named John O'Leary. And rather than going to bed that night tired, thinking about what he was going to do for himself the following day, he went home and he journaled on one question. What can I do? And the following day, in a snowstorm in St. Louis, Missouri, on January 18th, 1987, uh, he shows up in my life and he never lets go. And he showed up again the following day and the following day, Uh, because one person told one person who told one person who told her daddy who told a new friend. Your lives matter. We forget it in the society we all live in, but we we all are sacred treasures to God above, and it is high time to remind ourselves and to act like it. Like, you're a gift. Your life matters. So I want to thank you all for the work you do, for the impact of it, and for believing like I do that the best days remain in front of us. So God bless you all. Thank you for coming out to Canadian Texas. Thank you again. You don't all need to stand up. I'm rarely.